Uh, hi everybody and welcome to this session. Uh, when training in competing and rowing over the years, we will eventually end up uh, training or, or competing in a stressful environment, perhaps on altitude, perhaps on heat, perhaps on both. Olympic Games and Paralympic Games in Tokyo will be no exception when it comes to heat. Therefore, it's a great privilege to introduce two of the very good experts, uh, Frank and Ida, on this field. Please enjoy. Ida Svensson graduated from Lowbury University in 2015 and got a PhD in exercise physiology and immunology. She currently has a full-time position in the Norwegian Olympic Training Center as a consultant for many sport. As a physiologist, she's specializing in endurance training. She works closely with the Olympic and Paralympic athletes and coaches from a variety of sports, for instance, us in rowing. She got a particular focus on physiolog physiological testing, heat acclimation, and on altitude training. Frank Brochery uh, completed his master in sports science before earning his PhD in exercise physiology. He has authored and co-authored a lot uh, of articles and plenty of books. He is fre frequently invited as a speaker and consultant with individu individual and team sports. Frank has more than 20 years of experience in, in, uh, in sports, mainly in football and in national and international and world championship and Olympic level. He is a senior researcher and acting as a lead sports scientist uh, to athletes at the French uh, Institute of Sport in CEP, which is located in Paris. His research interest mainly focused on impact on uh, stressful environments like altitude and heat and on exercise induced fatigue development. Prior to joining INSEP, he was working as a full-time consultant in different professional football clubs and national teams. Please enjoy uh, the session, and uh, there will be possible to answer to ask questions uh, during the week, and it will be answered on the December fifth. I will come back to that after the session. Enjoy. No other species in the world uh, is able to survive in such an extreme range of environments as us humans. Uh, from the Danakil uh, depression in Ethiopia, where daytime temperatures can exceed 50 degrees Celsius, to Oymyakon, the coldest inhabited place on Earth, uh, where the record low is minus 70 degrees Celsius, which is actually colder than the average surface temperature on Mars. And to this town that you see on the right here, uh, La Rinconda in Peru, it's the, the highest inhabited place on earth, 5,000 meters above sea level. And obviously one of the main reasons that we're able to survive in these environments and to thrive in these environments is that we have a technology that allows us to uh, manipulate our surroundings and, um, and actually make the most out of these kinds of situations. But actually, in addition, our physiology is surprisingly uh, adaptable to the environment. And that includes both genetic adaptations, like those you would see in the population of uh, La Rinconda, uh, who are born with uh, substantially more blood and more hemoglobin than uh, normal sea level uh, inhabitants. But it also means that if you expose any of us to one of these environments over a, a shorter period of time, uh, our body will actually adapt. And obviously, none of your athletes are likely to ever um, be exposed to anything as extreme as these environments. But unlike most people, your athletes are also not only expected to survive, but also to perform in these conditions. And um, probably the most relevant for rowing in terms of uh, extreme environmental conditions that your athletes might be exposed to are a heat and altitude. Uh, and so these are the two topics that I'm gonna focus most on during this talk. And heat is obviously very relevant at the, at the moment with the upcoming Tokyo Olympics. Uh, as you can see from this graph, the, uh, the Tokyo Olympic Games are expected to be the most challenging in terms of um, climate that have ever been experienced under an Olympic Games. So you see that the combination of high he heat and high humidity makes Tokyo more challenging than either Beijing, Rio or Athens. And here in Norway, we've, uh, we've actually tested quite a few of our almost all of our athletes that will be going to Tokyo and are competing in endurance events outdoors to look at how this climate influences their performance. And from the uh, red dotted line, you can see an average performance decrement. Uh, and this is measured then as 
speed or power output uh, at threshold. And this average performance decrement is in the region of six to seven percent. But as you can see from each of these individual bars, each of these represents an athlete from one of our endurance sports, everything from rowing, kayaking to cycling and marathon running. But here you can see that there's actually very large individual differences. Some athletes only have a two to three percent uh, reduction in performance, whereas one athlete actually had a 15 percent reduction in performance. So all of these athletes did perform worse in the Tokyo conditions and all of these athletes were unacclimatized. Uh, un but you can see that there is a large individual, individual difference in heat tolerance uh, at baseline. I'm not going to go too much into the, the details of the physiology, but, but briefly, the, recent, the reason why performance is impaired in the heat is one, that the, the body will always prioritize to try and keep and maintain homeostasis and to keep body temperature around about 37 degrees Celsius. So when body temperature begins to rise because the environment is hot and your muscles are also producing heat when you're exercising, the body will prioritize to send blood to the skin to cool off. And this means that there's reduced blood flow to working muscles and therefore also reduced oxygen delivery, which means that at a given workload, your athlete will have a higher heart rate, a higher blood lactate, and it will feel harder than if they were doing the same work in a cool environment. There's also increased sweating, which increases the risk of dehydration and cramps. And increased body temperature also impairs enzyme function. So all the chemical processes in your body are um, designed to function optimally around 37 degrees. So when the temperature gets hotter than this, all these processes slow down and this also results in uh, reduced muscle function. And finally, there's a negative effect on cognitive processes. And this leads to reduced coordination, impaired decision making. Uh, these are especially important in uh, sports that have a large technical or tactical uh, element to them. Uh, and in my work with, uh, with kind of heat acclimation and um, looking at ways to optimize performance in the heat, uh, started for real before the, the road cycling world championships in, in Qatar, where the conditions were expected to be really tough. <clears throat> and the graph that you can see there, many of you will probably recognize as a kind of a typical lactate profile test with power output along the x-axis and blood lactate concentration on the y-axis. <clears throat> and the blue line you can see, that is one of, one of our uh, road cyclists, that's their profile in 18 degrees Celsius, so kind of normal conditions. And the red line is that same athlete in 33 degrees before he was heat acclimated. And you see that there's, there's a large both upward and leftward shift of, of that curve, indicating the performance is substantially worse uh, in the heat than in the cool conditions. And then you have the yellow line, which is the same athlete after approximately two weeks of heat acclimation, where he trained five or six times a week in, in 33 degrees. And you see that that curve is almost normalized. You see there's still a, it rises a little bit more quickly towards the end, and this would probably be further exacerbated uh, if the duration of the test was very long. So we see that with those that respond uh, especially well to heat acclimation, you can eliminate a substantial portion of that uh, performance decrement. Although, as I mentioned, all athletes will always perform slightly worse when it's really hot than in, when it's cold because the body will always have to use some energy to keep cool and keep body temperature within that, uh, an acceptable range for health. So there will always be a slight performance decrement, but a lot of this can be eliminated with an effective acclimation. <clears throat> and then uh, before the Rowing World Championships uh, in 2017 in Florida, uh, we wanted to do something similar with the, uh, the rowing team to prepare them for the conditions out there. And they'd recently been published an article looking at uh, hot water immersion as an alternative to heat training to uh, heat acclimatized athletes. So we, this was a really attractive idea for us because uh, instead of interfering with training sessions, it, from this paper, it looked like you could just have the athlete sit in a hot bath after training and you would get much of the same effect. But we obviously wanted to test this out in a, in a real life setting with elite athletes. <clears throat> so we divided our, uh, our cohort going to the World Championships into two. One group did uh, the hot water immersion post-exercise, where they sat for 20 to 40 minutes in, in 40 degrees Celsius. So they started at 20 minutes and they built gradually up as they were able to tolerate more. And then the second group did a more traditional uh, heat activation where they trained for 45 minutes at low intensity in 
33 to 35 degrees. And what we found was that uh, in agreement with the, the paper looking at hot water immersion, the athletes who did the hot water immersion did see uh, some heat acclimation, but it was not as good as the group training in the heat. And in addition, the, the athletes actually uh, who were doing the hot water immersion found it really tiring <laughs> and really hard work to sit in the, in the hot water. And it was a lot more draining than we expected. So uh, it wasn't quite what we expected in terms of you being able to use it as something that would not interfere with training at all because we actually saw that even just the hot bath required recovery time and they, they sweated a lot, they got dehydrated. Um, so it cost the athletes a lot more than expected doing the hot water immersion. And in addition, the effect was not as good. So since then, we've kind of gone away from the, the hot water immersion method and focused solely on the, the heat training aspect. Uh, and this is a method we've used now, uh, both before the World uh, Champs in 2018 and 2019, and a couple of the athletes also did something similar before the, the European Championships in, now in 2020. And uh, because this is a, a part of the training where the athletes obviously need to be on water as much as possible, Instead of using the environmental chamber we have at the Olympic Training Center in Oslo, uh, we've rigged up kind of a homemade um, setup with a, um, a greenhouse tent that they can have at the rowing arena so that they can come straight off the water and then they can do um, around 45 minutes of easy cycling uh, straight after the session on the water so that they get as much of that sport specific training as possible rather than having to drive into Oslo and maybe compromise on the, on the rowing. Uh, or have to do something on the ergometer instead, which isn't that relevant at this part of the season. And we found that this, obviously, there's, uh, it doesn't look as fancy as our environmental chamber, but uh, it works surprisingly well, uh, at least in the summer months when you also have kind of warmish temperatures outside and, and it's generally sunny, uh, even in Norway. And as I mentioned, uh, a few of the athletes have done this also, uh, for example, before the the European Championships this year, uh, and that's because they feel that actually the heat, uh, the heat training gives them some benefits in terms of a training stimulus, not only for heat acclimation, but just for performance in general. And this is also supported by um, some studies in the literature that indicate that the adaptations you get from heat acclimation can also be beneficial for aerobic capacity in general. Uh, and in particular, a recent study has looked at uh, hemoglobin mass and blood volume, and uh, that's the the graph you can see on the left here, you had one group uh, doing the heat sessions and another group doing the same training sessions in cool conditions. And they did see a significant increase in hemoglobin mass in the heat training group. This was over five weeks, so it's a substantially longer period than the kind of traditional two weeks you, you would use for heat acclimation. So it does look that like uh, heat training could be a useful tool to use and maybe periodize into your training, not only when you're competing in the heat, uh, and certainly it it doesn't have a negative impact on performance. So I think if you're trying to convince uh, your athletes or other coaches to, to do a, for example, before Tokyo, I would say that you're 100% 100 guaranteed that the heat acclimation will have a positive effect. And even if you don't know whether in the race you're going to, um, whether it's going to be hot or maybe it, the temperature varies a lot there, it might be cool. It's never really going to have an, a negative effect as long as you conduct it in a, kind of appropriate manner and you don't let it compromise the, the tapering process and the sport specific training of the athlete. <laughs> We've also done quite a lot of testing uh, in Tokyo conditions with a few of our other sports. Um, this includes the, the triathletes have done uh, a, substa a substantial amount. And we did a kind of a, a, a simulated Olympic distance triathlon in, in Tokyo conditions during a training camp. So they did, after they first heat acclimatized and then they did two races with about six days um, separation. And what we, what we see is that uh, the core temperature at the finish line is in all the athletes was somewhere between 40 and 41 degrees Celsius, which is extremely high. This is, uh, if you'd ask the doctor, this is definitely in a range that uh, could be dangerous for health in terms of heat stroke risk. But it appears that when the athletes are well acclimatized, they get something called acquired thermal tolerance, which means that their cells and their bodies have been exposed to increases in temperature during the uh, heat training, during the acclimation process, which means that they're able to tolerate it in a completely different way than an unacclimated athlete. But this does mean that there's a significant risk of heat illness uh, in the kind of climate that Tokyo poses if the athlete is not acclimatized. 
And obviously this, uh, the triathletes have a much longer duration than the rowers, but I think this is still useful for you guys to have in the back of your mind if you have longer training sessions outside, that even if you arrive in Tokyo uh, a long enough time before the first race that your athletes should be acclimatized by race day, I would still suggest doing something uh, beforehand so that they're actually at least partially acclimatized when they get to Japan so that they can get the most out of the training sessions, both in terms of being able to, um, to handle the conditions and get kind of perform optimally during training, but also because of the actual health risk of, of conducting long training sessions in that climate if you're not, if you haven't been exposed to that at all um, in the preparation. <clears throat> Uh, and with the triathletes, we also looked at kind of what impact poor temp or the activity before the race starts. So this includes kind of warm up and any kind of cooling strategies. Uh, what impact this had on core temperature, both at the start and during the, the race. And I see that I've not, uh, not translated this from Norwegian, but I think it's fairly easy to explain to you. So the two uh, lines are the same athlete doing the same race with six days apart. And the blue line is the first time he did the race. And there he did his normal warm-up uh, routines, uh, didn't really have any extra focus on kind of hydration or any kind of cooling strategies. And you see that he, he starts the race with a core temperature of about 38.3 degrees. And you can see then that the, the core temperature increases, it flattens out a little bit on the bike because you have a bit more uh, airflow that cools him down and then it increases substantially again during the run and he ends up at finishing uh, at 41 degrees. And then the second time, we had a lot more focus on uh, taking down the intensity of the, the warm up, spending more time in the shade, ingesting cool fluids, and he also used a cooling vest. And we see that at this point, he starts the race with a substantially lower core body temperature. And this is maintained through, this difference is maintained throughout the race. So he actually finishes the race a degree cooler than he did uh, on day one. And this will have a substantial impact on performance because once your body temperature gets too high, like I mentioned earlier, it will impact negatively both on uh, the kind of the physical and the, the mental processes in the body. So if you can start the competition with the lowest possible core temperature, this is, would definitely be beneficial, particularly in these races with a long duration. But I think also uh, this would be relevant in rowing. And in terms of what you do before, uh, before race start, this is kind of particularly relevant perhaps for the lightweight rowers that have uh, their weight making routines. We've also done some core temperature measurements with them. And what we see is that uh, the routines that they have for, for kind of sweating and making weight uh, substantially increase their core body temperature. And this is really difficult to get down again before they then start their warm up after they've weighed in. So this is at least something to have in the back of your mind if you work with lightweight rowers and they're competing in heat that the focus should be on, on normalizing core body temperature and rehydrating after, after they've weighed in if they've... Uh, if they've done things to kind of increase core temperature before that to sweat out. And another way that you can, uh, you can manipulate core body temperature before start other than kind of the um, uh, changing the warm-up routines is you can uh, use pre-cooling. And we see you can do it, you can probably do a little bit with a cooling vest. It's not very effective. Uh, that influences more kind of the athlete's feeling and skin temperature. But what, what is really effective is pre-cooling by a cold water immersion. And this is, again, probably not that relevant for rowing. It's very relevant in the, the sports that have a long enough duration that the start intensity is quite low because obviously when you're getting the, the athlete to sit in a bath of cool water, it's not ice water, but it um, obviously has to be substantially less than body temperature. You have a really effective reduction in core body temperature, but you also reduce muscle temperature, which, for example, in rowing where you're going out and it's kind of maximal intensity from the start, that probably isn't a good idea. But I thought I'd show you because it's, it's actually a really effective method and we see with kind of marathon runners and the road cyclists that will have a duration of up to kind of five or six hours and the start intensity is, is relatively low, then this is a really, really useful cooling strategy. And it's quite aggressive, but it's definitely the most effective in terms of uh, actually reducing core body temperature. Um, so we have this environmental chamber in Oslo that we've used now for the last couple of years and uh, all our athletes that are competing outdoors in Tokyo, um, we have in for several testing sessions or, uh, or quite a lot of testing sessions usually in this, in this heat chamber set the Tokyo conditions and we look at uh, heat acclimation strategies. So uh, 
since there's differences in intolerance, baseline heat tolerance, there's also differences in how quickly individual athletes acclimate. Some might take 10 days, some might take 18 days. So we try and test this out beforehand so that we can tailor it optimally before, before the games. And we also look at where the athlete's thinking of being. If the, for example, if the athlete uh, is planning on being on an altitude camp, then we have to kind of tailor the, the heat acclimation strategy around that so that it interferes minimally with their, their normal preparation. Uh, we test out um, different cooling strategies. We measure sweat rates and tailor hydration plans. We look at with how much they sweat. We also look at kind of um, having the athletes try out their hydration plan because we also know that um, gastrointestinal distress is exacerbated in the heat. So they sweat more, they lose more salt. So you have a, a greater need for uh, intake of fluid and salt and carbohydrate in the heat. But at the same time, your body is your stomach is less able to actually absorb uh, those things. So sometimes we have to make a compromise in terms of how much we're willing to let that athlete dehydrate be dehydrated by the finish line. And we obviously want it to be as little as possible. But sometimes we have to look at what's actually feasible for the, for the athlete to manage to intake during a, a race situation in the heat. And then we look at pacing strategies and warm-up routines, often with measures of core body temperature to look how this influences um, both baseline and how core body temperature increases during the race. And then we're with, the uh, with the psychologist, we, with some athletes, we look at kind of mental strategies to maintain focus and preserve technical and tactical abilities if we see that this is something the athlete um, struggles with in the heat. Uh, we also have a few uh, para-athletes going to Tokyo. And we know that um, particularly the ones with spinal cord injuries have uh, an increased risk of heat stroke and a bigger performance decrement in the heat. And this is because the body's most important mechanisms for regulating body temperature are actually controlled by the central nervous system. And if you have a spinal cord injury, you have a, a substantially reduced capacity to regulate temperature, and you also have an impaired thermal perception. So the athletes might not feel that they're overheating, even if they are. And because they also have a lower stroke volume at baseline, there's a suggestion that they might have an even bigger decrease in performance in the heat compared to um, non-spinal cord injured athletes. And we see this is particularly bad with athletes with really high spinal cord injuries. And this, this is usually in the kind of sports like shooting and stuff where you have, um, have tetraplegic athletes. But even for the, the kind of athletes that might be uh, partaking in the, the uh, para rowing, so the ones with lower spinal cord injuries, this will still be an issue. But the good thing is that at least with our athletes, we see that they still, at least with the ones with the lower spinal cord injuries, still respond really well to heat acclimation. Although this isn't well documented in the literature, this is at least our, our experience with our athletes. So uh, they should probably have an extra kind of extra focus on it, but it's definitely impossible to do something about in our experience. So just to sum up the, the heat section, um, both high temperature and high humidity have a big impact on endurance performance. So the high humidity bit in terms of Tokyo is really important because this is why the, if you just look at the temperature, it doesn't look like it's going to be that challenging. But the fact that the um, humidity is so high means that the air is already really saturated with water. And so one of the body's main ways of cooling down is through sweat. And sweat then has to evaporate from the skin in order to cool us down. And if there's already a lot of uh, liquid in the air around us, sweat doesn't evaporate in the same way. It just stays on the skin. And this means that you actually remove one of our most effective ways of, of regulating our own body temperature when you're in a place like Tokyo where the air humidity is so high. Uh, there are large individual differences in heat tolerance uh, and heat acclimation is definitely the most effective way to optimize performance. So you can do a bit with cooling strategies and different things, but uh, priority number one should always be the heat acclimation. Uh, here you can, you can improve performance by 15%, the cooling strategies are maybe one to 2%. And training sessions in the heat uh, appeared better than kind of passive heating for heat acclimation, so better than sauna or uh, hot water immersion. And typically heat acclimation takes around 14 days. Uh, there are individual differences in this, and we see that actually the, the, pro the main uh, part of the acclimation occurs quite early on. So typically the first four to six days, if you do uh, heat acclimation with an athlete, these will be the, the days that the athlete find it really, really tough. After that, it will kind of, um, they'll feel that it starts getting easier. And this is because actually you, you adapt quite quickly during the first four to six days. So if you're not able to do a full, if you don't have 14 days to do a full acclimation, then you will still get quite, out, quite a lot out of doing uh, four to six days with your athletes 
uh, or the six sessions of heat training with your athletes beforehand. And some heat adaptations may also be beneficial for poor performance in temperate conditions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, altitude. Um, it's probably unlikely that most of your athletes will have to compete uh, at altitude, but uh, it's definitely something that a lot of athletes use in their training. And the interest in altitude training uh, really started after the, the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. And this was at 2,240 meters above sea level. And what they saw in these Olympic Games was that actually there were record performances in the sprints and jumps and throws because the air resistance up there is, uh, is a lot less. But there were really poor performances in endurance events. And a very large or a larger proportion of medalists than expected were altitude natives. So they came from areas where they already lived at altitude. Uh, and in Norway, we're not actually allowed to, there's a law that says that uh, elite athletes aren't allowed to use artificial uh, altitude. So our athletes only ever use um, what's called hyperbaric hypoxia, so natural altitude where they travel uh, and both live and train at altitude. Sometimes they also travel uh, a bit lower and do some of their training at a lower elevation. But we don't use altitude tents or altitude chambers because they're not allowed for our athletes. And uh, 2,000 meters is kind of a, a very typical training altitude for, for athletes. Most will train at somewhere between 1,800 to 2,500 meters. And at 2,000 meters, you see that there's actually 20% fewer oxygen molecules in every breath you breathe in. And this, um, this has a large impact on, um, particularly on VO2 max. Uh, so you see that in an unacclimatized individual, um, VO2 max is reduced by 10 to 13% at 2,000 meters compared to sea level. And this is also translated into um, uh, some maximal intensities. So at a given power output, you will uh, you'll breathe more, your heart rate will be higher, and your blood lactate will be higher, and it will feel harder than the same power output at sea level. And the kind of the adaptations that most athletes are looking for when they travel to altitude, the, the first is an increase in hemoglobin mass uh, and uh, red blood cell volume. So you're looking at increasing the, the blood's oxygen ca carrying capacity so that you can transport more blood to working muscles. We also see uh, ventilatory adaptations. These are more acute and they're very, very relevant if you're competing at altitude. We see during the first days, there's quite a big shift in how the athlete ventilates both um, at rest and during exercise, which is has a big impact on kind of their, their training and performance during the first few days, but will return to normal once they go down to sea level. So it doesn't have much effect on kind of sea level performance. We also see um, adaptations in the, in the muscles and peripheral adaptations. So both the, the, the myoglobin content in the muscles and the buffering capacity are both improved uh, following altitude training. Most of the focus has always been on uh, hemoglobin mass. This is probably the most important adaptation, but it's also, the only adaptation that we we are consistently able to, to measure quite easily in the laboratory so it's always um, received quite a lot of attention and this graph shows uh, changes in hemoglobin mass following altitude training in uh, in some of our athletes so the, the black dots are individual athletes and the bars are uh, kind of the average for the sport and as you can see for rowing there's quite a, a large variation. We seem to have some athletes that, that respond really well and some athletes that respond less well. But in general, uh, none have an, a negative effect and the average performance improvement is around 3%. We see that there's obviously differences in, in the training concept that these different sports do at altitude. But in general, the Norwegian model is that at altitude, it's generally high volume, lower intensity training. And I think the reason, if we go back to the first graph, you can see that um, the percentage change in hemoglobin mass for rowing is actually in the lower end of the spectrum compared to a few of the other sports. I think a large uh, part of the explanation for this is that rowers at baseline already have a really high hemoglobin mass. And that's both because of the training they do and because of body size. This is obviously, if you're a small athlete, like some of these um, Nordic combined athletes, they'll have less hemoglobin because their bodies are smaller and they have less blood. Whereas the rowers are taller, they're bigger, they have more blood in general. And also they are, they generally have quite a high absolute VO2 max, which means that they 
this generally correlates also with a high absolute hemoglobin mass. And we typically see that the higher your baseline hemoglobin mass, the, the more difficult it is to kind of increase it. That most of us appear to have some kind of physiological ceiling that means that at some point you actually have as much hemoglobin as your body can naturally without kind of artificially manipulating it. Um, that's as much as you can get to. So the closer you are to that physiological ceiling, perhaps the less of an effect of altitude training you might have because you're, you're already, this aspect is already really, really highly developed in this athlete. Uh, so the rowers typically have um, three different uh, training camps they do during the year. The first is an autumn training camp. Uh, it's typically um, at Sierra Nevada uh, in Spain. And here they live at 2,300 meters and then they, uh, they train at um, a lake that's at 900 meters and they do the rest of their training at kind of 2,300 to up to 3,000 meters. And that includes kind of hiking, jogging, uh, cycling and a bit of strength training while the rowing training is at, at 900 meters. And all of these are about three weeks in duration. Um, the second camp is a, a winter camp. This is a cross-country skiing camp first, uh, first and foremost in Livigno. Uh, and they live and train at around 1,900 to 2,000 meters. And this again is a, the biggest focus and it's on kind of general aerobic capacity, uh, lots of cross-country skiing, some rowing ergometer and some strength training, but um, high volume and again lower intensity than uh, that what they would train at at sea level. And the final is uh, a summer camp that's usually kind of a, a pre pre competition um, or um, championship uh, training camp. And this is again in Lavinia. Um, and this is a, a lot more more sport specific training in terms of more rowing on water. Uh, and again, they live at 2,000 meters, and, and most of the training is at 1,800 to 2,500 meters. So most of this is a um, the training camps they do. Um, typically follow a kind of a live high, train high model with some training um, conducted at, at lower elevations. Uh, and this shows the, um, the hemoglobin mass changes of, uh, of one individual athlete uh, during one, well, from different training camps. So the first one is, uh, so what you can see, um, the light blue bars are pre-altitude and the slightly darker blue bars are post-altitude. And here again, you can see that the increase following altitude training appears to be related to baseline. So this first training camp in 2015, where it comes in with base, quite a low baseline hemoglobin mass, he has a really good response, 6.4%. Whereas the one in uh, the summer of 2019, you see that baseline hemoglobin mass is already really high. And it doesn't appear that he's actually able to increase it anymore, even after three weeks at altitude. So in terms of when you when you place these altitude training camps during the season, it might be relevant to think what your athlete is kind of going into that training camp with. If they're, they're based on hemoglobin mass is already really high, then maybe they don't have as big a benefit as if in periods where it's lower. At the same time, um, like I mentioned, there are other physiological adaptations to training at altitude that also can be beneficial for performance. So that's not to say that this um, 2019 summer camp uh, didn't improve have a positive impact on the on the athlete's performance and what we see is that actually the altitude training is also a really nice way of um, periodizing the training in a good way that you get a really good block of kind of aerobic general base training that when the athletes get home they they get a positive benefit of this even if they perhaps don't have that significant improvement in hemoglobin mass um, so this is kind of the the norwegian model that we uh, that almost all of our sports follow really and that is that when you're at altitude, the priority, the priority is aerobic capacity. You don't go to altitude to, uh, for hypertrophy or to get stronger or to improve anaerobic capacity. The focus of this particular block of training is aerobic capacity and VO2 max. So the training is uh, high volume with slightly lower intensity. So typically nothing very much above threshold. And the, the sessions above threshold are typically then place towards the end of the training camp when the athletes are, begin, uh, are, are starting to acclimatize to the altitude and certainly not during the first few days. Uh, no anaerobic training and during the, they do do strength training, but this is more maintenance. So it's longer rests and fewer sets to make sure that um, if any of you have trained strength uh, or resistance training altitude, you'll notice that actually you, you quite quickly breathe really heavily and you get a high heart rate even during the kind of the resistance training that shouldn't, it shouldn't be um, a high heart rate session so um, to kind of keep it 
from the total training load from becoming too high, the, the rest should be longer and the sets should be fewer during the strength, uh, strength training sessions. And these should mainly be kind of maintenance rather than um, to try and develop strength or get stronger or, or get bigger. Um, we also advise our athletes to avoid novel exercises that cause um, muscle damage or soreness. This is because any inflammation in the body uh, will actually reduce um, EPO production and therefore reduce the, the red blood cell response. So we, we try to avoid anything. Uh, this also applies to infections and uh, injuries as well, which I'm going to come back to a little bit, but, but we try to avoid anything that causes substantial muscle damage. Uh, in terms of sleep and recovery, the, we see that athletes typically require slightly longer to recover from the same session when they're at altitude. Um, and at the same time, we see that sleep quality is substantially reduced. And this is particularly during the first few weeks or at higher elevations. So we have quite a few of our athletes have um, tried out uh, living at higher elevations, so up to kind of 3,000 meters and above. And what we see is that when they live this high, sleep quality is really, really reduced. And also that the uh, illness risk appears to be um the bigger so even though um living at higher elevation would, on paper gives a bigger stimuli for um a better uh, hemoglobin mass response we actually see that in practice it isn't um it doesn't really work for most athletes because they they don't sleep well they get sick and their training quality is reduced and i think because of even if you live at 2000 meters you're Sleep quality will be reduced. It's important for coaches to kind of take this into consideration when planning meal times and, and training times. So they allow for a few more hours of sleep to compensate for the, the poorest sleep quality. And this is a little bit uh, what I mentioned is that um, if an athlete is sick, they shouldn't be at altitude. I would say that you could almost, even if an athlete gets a cold, I would normally say, well, they're certainly not going to come that well out of the uh, out of the training camp, and I wouldn't send them to altitude if they already have a cold or any kind of infection uh, in their body. And that's because the inflammation reduces red blood, red blood cell production, and hypoxia might actually delay the recovery. So, um, not only will it stop them getting kind of that altitude response that they're looking for, but they might be sick for longer because their body is just doesn't isn't able to uh, fight the infection in the same way that it is at sea level. So, if an athlete is sick, they shouldn't be at altitude. Uh, there's also been uh, a few studies looking at whether or not there's an increased infection risk at altitude. So we see that if you do the, the same training session in uh, hypoxia or, or at 2000 meters compared to um, sea level, even if you do it at the same heart rate and the same kind of relative exercise intensity, you still get a bigger stress hormone response, so a bigger cortisol response. And this, um, in theory, would result in some minor immunosuppression, meaning that the athlete's immune system would be less able to fight off an infection if it, uh, if it kind of met a germ or a virus. But what we see at altitude is that actually athletes are typically uh, exposed to much fewer pathogens, so much fewer bacteria, much fewer virus than what they would be at home at sea level because they're quite isolated. They normally live on a, uh, at a hotel with, with fewer people. So we see that, okay, maybe the immune system is a tiny bit reduced, but actually there's, there's very little... Um, infection going around um, so they typically don't get sick even so so we see in in practice if the athletes especially if they have good routines for hygiene um, and nutrition and hydration and they get enough sleep we actually don't in practice see um, the athletes get sick more often at altitude than at sea level uh, i'm not a nutritionist so i'm not going to go too much into the details here but uh, obviously this is something that that is important to consider at altitude and um, this is again perhaps particularly relevant if you have kind of uh, lightweight rowers and they're um well you should at least consider whether sending them to altitude is appropriate in in seasons where they're maybe uh cutting weight or or working on kind of i think the focus when you're at altitude should never be to lose weight and uh, we always advise our athletes to avoid any weight loss at altitude even if you're um kind of normal weight to start with uh, we see this, this typically has a negative effect on, on the uh, hemoglobin mass response and the, the kind of the outcomes of the altitude training camp. Uh, but we see that actually resting metabolism is somewhat increased. And in addition, at least our athletes typically have a higher training volume while they're at training, uh, while they're at altitude, which means that there's increased energy expenditure in total. And that means that the athletes have to eat more when they're at altitude than what they do at sea level. 
and appetite might also be reduced at altitude. So it's kind of, you really need to focus on this with the athletes to get them to um, have a sufficient energy intake to avoid weight loss. We know that iron status is, uh, is important uh, because iron is uh, necessary to produce new red blood cells. So if you have insufficient iron stores, you won't actually be able to produce any more red blood cells or any more hemoglobin, even if you're exposed to altitude for months and months on end. So it's important to check iron status uh, prior to departure. And if your, uh, your athletes are iron deficient, um, then the nutritionist should uh, recommend an, a, a supplement so that they have normal iron stores uh, by the time they go to, go, to the, uh, or go to altitude. And we also see that there's increased fluid loss, both because you're breathing more, so you're losing more fluid um, through ventilation, and also because uh, you actually urinate more when you're at altitude and there's often very low humidity in the air, the air's really dry. So we see that there is actually a, a greater need for, athletes also need to drink more when they're at altitude compared to sea level. So there's a few things to kind of keep in mind because all of these will, it's important to keep your athletes in as good a balance as possible if you want the best possible response from, or, or altitude response. Um, I think I mentioned this briefly in terms of uh, what we do with planning for athletes in terms of that quite a lot of our athletes use altitude uh, during the final preparation phase before um, championships and important competitions. And a lot of them are planning on being at altitude uh, the final weeks before uh, the Tokyo Olympics. So we've had a little look at uh, whether it's able to, whether you can actually combine heat acclimation with altitude. So we did some testing with the triathletes at uh, Sierra Nevada, so they were living and training at 2,300 meters, and we got them to carry out kind of a traditional uh, heat acclimation where they were training about 45 to 60 minutes um, a day. They did 10 sessions of this in a, a kind of a homemade heat chamber in one of the, the rooms down there, and uh, we did both performance tests and um, measured the hemoglobin mass before and after, and what we saw was that there was certainly no negative effect of combining the two. In fact, they there might be a small positive effect. I think you should obviously be very careful with this because you have two, both altitude and heat uh, are both quite big physiological stresses. So combining them gives a really good stimulus, but it also gives quite a big extra load on the athlete. So I think it, it's definitely possible to combine them and you can come, you can have an athlete that has a really good outcome from combining the two, um, but you need to be really careful about controlling training load uh, around those sessions because you are placing quite a significant stress on the athlete's body by combining both heat and altitude at the same time. Uh, so just to summarize, um, your athletes will probably at some time have to train or compete in a stressful environment. And we know that both heat and altitude negatively impair endurance performance, at least acutely. However, a very large proportion of this performance decrement can be eliminated through a good uh, acclimatization. Um, and this acclimatization, both the heat and altitude, result in physiological adaptations that can also be beneficial uh, to performance at sea level if you've been acclimatized to altitude or in cool conditions if you've been acclimatized uh, to heat. And as such, I would say that both heat and hypoxia can be really useful tools uh, to use, use in the training process to augment aerobic adaptation. So these are, again, like I mentioned, you, for example, training in the heat, you get a, a really good um, stimulus of the kind of, um, uh, especially the cardiovascular system. So you train your stroke volume, your athlete can set at a kind of a, quite a high heart rate, but um, a low power output. So it's in terms of kind of the muscular thing, it's quite um, kind. <laughs> so um, you can get, a, like I said, a really good training of the cardiovascular system and an extra stimulus on the kind of aerobic capacity through both heat training and altitude training. However, in our experience, they should definitely be used with care and periodized appropriately. So uh, yes, you're um, kind of increasing the stimulus for adaptation, but as soon as you're increasing the stimulus, you're also increasing the stress. So, um, and particularly because different athletes tolerate both heat and altitude slightly differently, it's, it's important to have kind of a good plan and to follow that um, and to be able to kind of change that plan as soon as you see that your athlete is actually that the total training load is becoming a bit too much and that they're responding negatively. So I think it's both of these, both heat and altitude are, have a lot of potential to be used in, in training uh, of endurance athletes, but they also have the potential to um, kind of push the athlete over the, on the other side of that knife edge that they're already kind of balancing along. <laughs>
All right. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I am Frank Brochery. I am a senior researcher and acting lead of the Sports Science Support at the French Institute of Sport. Following the talk from Ida Svensson, I will hopefully complement some points and try to provide you some new insights regarding the usefulness of adding environmental stress for acclimatization and performance optimization. First of all, altitude training is in most of cases used to enhance endurance performance, notably due to its erythropoietic response. In fact, oxygen deprivated environments triggers the if one alpha that generate a myriad of molecular adaptation, the primary endpoints being the increase in hemoglobin mass that will possibly transfer some improvement in maximal oxygen consumption. This is basically uh, leading to some two classical altitude training, the living eye training eye and the living eye training low methods. For an effective altitude training camp, some authors have suggested that a low altitude level will attenuate the erythropoietic response and the performance. For that, it is then suggested to use altitude level ranging 2000 2500 to trigger the best response. It is also important to remember that when using normobaric hypoxia or simulated altitude, a sufficient amount of time must be spent at altitude, generally higher than 16 hours per day. And file, finally, it is also important that the altitude camp must be sufficiently long enough to trigger the physiological adaptation. And for that, we recommend three to four weeks of training. Some have suggested that athletes with already high initial hemoglobin mass have a limited ability to increase their hemoglobin mass following an altitude camp. Pulling the data from our own studies, but also from other research, we have demonstrated that the hemoglobin mass is trivially to moderately associated with its initial level. That means that there is still room for improvement even in athletes with an already high initial hemoglobin mass. Another paramount point to mention is that altitude training camp must be carefully controlled before and sufficient time before and during the training camp. And for that, we will make some blood sampling for iron level, but also uh, carefully controlled with earth rate variability. And we will also carefully monitor the training load and fatigue state. And if you are using some specific device like the altitude tents, we have suggested to also record the carbon dioxide because with a rise in temperature and humidity in such small environment, there is some concern concerning the sleep quality of the athlete. Recently, some training blogs and media has promoted heat training as the poor men's altitude training to promote some endurance performance. Interestingly, a recent uh, publication have shown that some possible different mechanisms may be at play. And in particular, an increase in plasma volume following heat acclimation that may be blunt the hemoglobin mass enhancement. 
Interestingly, some recent findings have reported that heat acclimation could increase hemoglobin mass. As you can see on this slide, some well-trained and also elite male cyclists perform one hour at low intensity at 40 degrees for five days per week, in addition to their regular training during a five, approximately five weeks. And the results shown that there is some improvement in hemoglobin mass, but also in plasma and blood volume. However, these changes do not significantly affect performance in temperate condition, with similar improvements observed whatever the condition used. This activates the debate on the usefulness of heat training for performance in temperate condition. But when a competition is scheduled in hot condition, such as the upcoming Olympics in Tokyo, a subtropical and humid climate, it is clear and compulsory to acclimate the athletes to cope as best as possible with the high ambient temperature, but also with the high level of humidity they will face during the competition. Of course, training per se may partially acclimatize the athletes. As you can see on this um, slide, if you are performing 11 weeks of interval training, you will be able to reduce your rectal temperature and heart rate compared to pre-training. But this will not equal the effect of the eight days of heat acclimation. Thus, the athletes could use natural environment or simulated environment to acclimatize or to acclimate. And the first and simple method is to work at self-paced exercise or at constant work rate, but the best result will be realized with a control intensity or control hyperthermia. And if the athletes do, do not have access for such uh, environment, they could use passive eating following their training in temperate condition. The practical point uh, is that the, du the duration is no more than 90 minutes and that exercise intensity is low. So this is very useful to implement it in a, in a planning. Without such acclimatization or acclimation, the performance will be deeply declined when performing in such environment. But after a partial acclimation, like one week, you will improve the performance. And after two weeks, the athletes will be able to uh, perform close to their temperate uh, uh, performance. And this is mainly due to several physiological adaptations. The first one being an increase in sweat rate. The second one, a decrease in skin and core temperature, an increase in plasma volume, a decrease in earth rate, an increase in thermal comfort, and finally, an increase in the exercise capacity. So acclimation or acclimatization will improve the adaptation. Therefore, the gain will persist for one week and progressively decline over one month. Note that the number of days of acclimatization do not impact the decay. But if you reperform a second acclimatization period, then the adaptation will be faster. Based on this, my first take home message would be that acclimatization or acclimation will be important before preparing a competition in a specific environment. Regarding endurance performance enhancement in temperate condition, even if it's difficult 
compare the different environmental stressors, they may differently impact the adaptation and the performance. And last but not least, it is the condition of competition that will decide about the terminal preparation. In the example of Tokyo Olympics, heat acclimatization must be a priority. Let's move to the second part I would like to share with you. And beside acclimatization, there is also some rooms for performance improvement using some specific uh, environmental exercise. We call them the living low training eye, and there is a multitude of methods that could be useful to improve both endurance, but also some uh, more explosive and anaerobic components of the fitness of the athletes. Because of the restriction of time, I will only focus on the repeated sprint in hypoxia, resistance training in hypoxia, and in a lower extent, blood flow restriction that may have some interest for rowing. The repeated sprint training in hypoxia consisted, as you can see on this video, to perform multiple sprint or maximal efforts interspace with incomplete recovery. Normally, you will have two or three sessions per week for a periodization around two to five weeks, and this exercise will be performed in altitude level around 3,000 meters. And we conduct a meta-analysis on several studies performed to date to show that there is a putative benefit when using such methods compared to similar training in normoxia or sea level. To date now, there is more than 25 studies showing its benefits. Just an example here to give to you, using some cyclists, and it's the first repeated sprint training in hypoxia to have shown some benefits in athletes. Conducted by Rafael Fez from Lausanne, using the following protocol 10 seconds sprinting, 20 seconds of recovery for five reps and five sets. And if you see, if you check the graph on the left side, you can see when this training is conducted at sea level, you have compared to the white bars, an improvement with the black bars following this training for most of the sprint. So this kind of training is working at sea level, as we know from repeated sprint ability. However, when you are adding the repeated sprint in hypoxia at 3,000 meters, you can see a clearer improvement for all sprint. And most importantly, we have also an improvement with a number of sprints that is performed and increased after this type of intervention. Altogether, this indicates a higher capacity to resist to fatigue. Concerning resistance training in hypoxia, the first studies to report some benefits used some quite low intensity or low load, as you can see, between 20 and 30% of one maximal repetition. And they report some improvement in hypertrophy, maximal force, and velocity. And if you can see on this graph, conducting either systemic hypoxia or local hypoxia using blood flow restriction, named Katsu in Japan, we can observe some improvement in muscle strength and hypertrophy, and muscle strength, but also muscle endurance. And in this particular study, so only the blood flow restriction provides some beneficial effects in sport-specific performance. 
using the same training paradigm, more Ramos Campo show that such training is beneficial for both lower and upper limbs. And more recently, some possible gains in strength, but also in some sport specific movement have been reported using a higher load ranging from 70 to 92% of one maximal repetition. It is also important to note that there is a growing interest of this training method using it instead of altitude now being tested. And it is probably premature for evidence-based practice, but it is clear that it's opened some doors for future research and future recommendation for training. As you can see on this video, combining blood flow restriction with heat exposition. And in this study, we use some rugby players randomly assigned in a group combining the methods. So, blood flow restriction with heat at 35 degrees, and another group using only blood flow restriction compared to a control condition where they are using their um, habitual training. This training lasts for three weeks, nine sessions total, addi additional training that is with four sets of 30, um, four sets at 30% of one maximal repetition at 50% of the arterial pressure. And the results show that there is an increase in hypertrophia through its circumference, but also an increase in strength development. We also observe a transfer in speed development with an increase in sprinting performance, but we did not observe uh, any effect on resistance to fatigue as tested with the repeated sprint ability. Another possibility is to combine the altitude methods. Here, we combine the classical living high training law with the repeated sprint training in hypoxia, with the primary aim to develop both aerobic and anaerobic qualities. And for that, we also recruit some elite field hockey players, assign randomly assigned in three groups, a control group, living low, training low, and two interventional groups, spending some time, more than 14 hours per day at an altitude of 2,500 to 300 met, 3,000 meters, called living high, training low for both groups, but also conducting an additional training of repeated sprint either in normoxia for the living eye training low group or in hypoxia for the living eye training low and eye group. And this consists to repeat four sets of five repetitions of five seconds interspaced with 25 seconds of recovery. The results indicate that for hemoglobin mass, both groups using chronical exposition to altitude, improve the hemoglobin mass immediately after the two weeks of altitude camp, and that the results were also maintained for at least three weeks. And concerning the muscle sample, I will try to check the video, yes. There is a significant molecular signaling and adaptations only in the group performing the maximal intensity exercise. 
this adaptation include oxygen signaling and transport and mitochondrial biogenesis. Interestingly, this physiological adaptation induces some benefits in aerobic performance, but also in repeated sprint ability. As you can see on these two graphs, there is an increase in the distance covered during the yo-yo test in the lower panel. And in the upper panel, you have a decrease also in the time to perform the sprint. Here, Bouchet and colleagues tried to combine altitude with heat. For that, they used 12 days on living eye training low versus control, normal bike condition, normoxic condition. And in the meantime, all the football training were performed in hot condition. And they demonstrated that there is some gains in plasma volume and hemoglobin mass in the hypoxic group only, but without any difference between groups for the aerobic performance. McCleaves and colleagues also combine altitude and heat with three weeks combining living high training low at 3,000 meters with heat acclimatization compared to heat only acclimatization or control. And they shown that only the combined intervention permit to improve hemoglobin mass, whereas only the hot condition permit to improve both plasma and blood volume. However, the gain in hemoglobin mass from the combined intervention did not uh, provide any support to improve the time trial performance. Contrarywise, in the hot condition, the gain in blood and plasma volume permit to observe some improvement in time trial. Thus, in this particular study, there is no reason to combine altitude and heat to optimize the performance. Based on this, my second key points and take home message will be that living low training high paradigms offers many opportunities to boost performance and that using heat or combination of methods or environmental stress may complete the strength and conditioning toolbox. The questions that remain to be solved are the periodization of all these methods independently, but also when they are consecutive to another one. Is there, is, is there some interaction or interference effects? This is currently unknown. That said, Mujica and colleagues recently suggest the possibility to schedule altitude camp and heat acclimation before a competition to be held in hot condition. And this is likely resembly Tokyo Olympics. In this example, before a competition to be held in July or August, the altitude camp will be performed in June for four weeks and followed by a heat acclimation in July before the competition. While there is some Empirical, evi empirical ev evidence that it is working. The only published paper reports that an elite race worker could, during a 20 months of preparation, incorporate seven different training cycles with two living eye training eye paradigm the A1 and A3 on this figure, and five living high training law methods and training camp interspace with two training using heat exposition, so two times six weeks, and two acclimatization 
preparation of two weeks before competition. And on the right graph, you can see that the performance in race walking in the 20 kilometers follow a gradual decrease in the time to perform, so consistent with an improvement in performance, and that have lead this case study, the athlete from this case study, to reach a medal during the Olympics in London. And regarding acclimatization, before a competition to be held in hot condition, the main point will be to its planification depending on the travel require requirements. In the case where athletes arrived on competition site earlier, they have the possibility to acclimatize before to travel and to finish their tapering on site, or to travel and to acclimatize and type, make their tapering on the site before the competition. And in the case they have to arrive late on competition site, they will have to acclimatize before and also to make their tapering before. So there is the several possibilities with a full acclimatization before departure or a acclimatization on B3 long time before with a maintenance of the adaptation before the tapering phase and travel. To conclude, Depending on the target, acclimatization using altitude or heat will be helpful. Second point, some training opportunities using additional environmental stress to optimize performance will be also interesting to improve performance. And there is some avenues to answer specific questions like interaction interference, dosage, delayed effects, and to improve the evidence-based practice we could provide to the coaches. Specific to Tokyo Olympics, some communications are available to beat the heat and to best prepare the athletes before this Olympics. And this is my last word, so I would like to thank my colleagues from Lausanne, Australia, or Qatar, and thanks you for your attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Ida. On the behalf of the Competitive Commission, I would like to thank you both for your excellent contribution to the World Rowing 2020 Virtual Coaches Conference. I would like to remind you all that uh, today's speakers will also be available for a live question session uh, on Sunday, 5th of December. Uh, please advance your questions for the session, who will be held at 10.20 Central European time, to Rosie Maglothling. Uh, her email address is rosie.maglothling at FISA. Rosie.meglothling at FISA.org. Or you can also put them in the Zoom chat during the live session. I will try to get as many questions answered as possible. Thank you all for joining and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.